Before we begin with the sermon, let us begin with prayer. Dear Father, who has created the universe and who is governing over the history of mankind and who is the living God, we thank you for allowing this time so that we could study upon the most important scriptures, the word, and the word of God, the Bible. Please be with us in this time, and we also pray that you will be able to help our dark hearts and also our stubborn hearts so that we'll be able to come to the understanding of the scriptures. There are many precious souls who have gathered together to learn your word, and we pray that through your word, all our inquiries and our problems and the hardships that are in our lives will be resolved. And in this time, we pray that we'll have the true knowledge and have the true happiness through this time as well. We rely in all the times in your merciful hands who has created the heavens and the earth in the in the hands of him who has loved us, our Father. Amen. Let us find one scripture, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 34. Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 34. Verse 16, if you have found it, let us read together. Search from the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these shall fail, not one shall lack her mate. For my mouth has commanded it, and his spirit has gathered them. During this week, we are going to be studying the Bible, and this Bible is the bestseller in history and it's been the most translated and it is a book that is beloved by so many individuals and the reason for all those reasons is found in the bible itself the book that we're going to be study upon this week is not a book that is written by man but rather it was written by the creator god and the almighty god There are many le life lessons and life problems that we need to resolve. What is my value? What is my purpose? Why am I living on this earth? Where did I come from and where am I going? And all those key questions we need to resolve. And we, more than anything, we need to learn what will happen after death. We need to resolve those issues or those problems, find the answers to those questions um, before we meet our death. And the reason why we are investing so much time to learn the scripture this week is to find that answer. I believe it will be a time that will amaze you. And I do not believe this is a coincidence that you are sitting here today because there is only one way that we can meet God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that is through the Bible. And the only way we can resolve the problems and questions of life is through the Bible. And that is the reason why uh, God has led you to this time to be joining us here today to learn upon uh, the Bible. And if you continue on till the end, then you'll be able to find the answers to those questions of life in a quite fast um, time, and you'll be able to come to realization what is most important. And what is the closest thing to mankind? It is death. Death cannot be avoided. In Psalms chapter 90, it says, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by a reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. After life is born, we are going step by step closer to death. 
you know, 70 seems like a very long time, but it's not a long time, in fact. And 80 years is only 960 months. It's already been six months since we started the year 2022. So if we continue at this pace, 960 months pass by, then everyone, most of everyone, meet their death. And something that gives a problem or a hardship to any individual is sin. Why is it that mankind has sin? And why is it that death approaches man? And why is it the truth that I do need to die or there I'm going to die? And who am I? What meaning do I have? And after death, what is waiting for me? Those questions cannot be resolved on my own accord. When does the history of mankind end? What is the purpose of the history of mankind? And what kind of future is waiting ahead of me? All those inquiries, those questions cannot be resolved alone by man. Even those who are most intelligible, intelligent in the world and those who have studied a lot in the Bible, or sorry, studied a lot in the world, cannot know the answer to these questions. No matter how long of a life you live in this world, you will not be able to find the answer on your own accord. And that is why God, the creator God, has given us the book to find the answer, and that is the Bible itself. Let us turn to Matthew. And if you look in Matthew, it says that, or the book of John, it says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The book that God has given to us is the Bible. And in fact, that Bible is the truth. The Bible makes us righteous or just, and that is the word of God. The reason why it does so um, is because the Bible records of the history from the beginning to the end, and it also has all the answers to all our questions, and therefore it says that the truth shall make you free. The, if we talk about the, the problems that we need to resolve, first is sin. Everyone who is born in this world has a conscience, and whenever we commit a sin, our conscience No, points out our wrongs, doings, and tells us we are in the wrong. The conscience that proves our wrongdoings is within me, and it continues to abide within me until my death. In Jeremiah, it says, the sins of Judah was written on a stone. And that's how the conscience records of our sin. You know, the big sins give us big pain, and the small sins cause us to have small pains. It's a phenomenon that happens throughout our lifetime. And is there truly a judgment after death? Is there truly a God that exists? This world is very beautiful. This earth is very beautiful and has quite an amazing order to it. And the reason being is because there is the design of God's within, and we need to find the answers to our questions. And another thing that we need to resolve is death. Death can approach me at any moment. And when we meet our death, we'll not be able to take away anything. What is death? And after death, the Bible records that there is a judgment and if there is a judgment, how can I avoid that judgment? Death, judgment, and also the eternal destination of a sinner is hell. You know, God wants to give us freedom regarding those things. And in order to give us that happiness, God has given us this Bible. And throughout this week, we are going to be studying upon it to really check whether it is the word of the creator God and whether it really has the answers to those problems that we have. The Bible records that life is 70 or by strength 
80 years. 80 years, if you equivalent to the number of months, is 960 months. It really is a blink of an eye. It goes pretty fast. There is a time when we have we are in our youth, but with time passing, we age and death will approach us. And the destination of anyone's life is death. Regardless of who you are, you're going to die. And the answer or the freedom from these things um, can only be given by God. And God has given us the Bible as a reference to find those answers. These are the important issues when it comes to man. The value or the purpose of man is the questions or the issues we need to resolve. Who am I? Why do I live? Where did I come from and where will I go? If you are not able to resolve these questions, you are not you will not be able to live with freedom. You will not be able to live with happiness. And that is why the Bible tells us, find your creator because you do definitely have a creator. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. We have a creator. If we truly have the creator, then we'll be able to find the answers to the questions or issues we have in life. Why are we studying the Bible this week? It's because the Bible is the book that is given by the creator God. Why should we study the Bible? The Bible is the only book given to man by God, the creator. And therefore, if you open up the first page of the Bible, this is the first scripture that appears. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's proclaiming that there is a creator and the fact that this creator God has started the history of mankind. And so if you go to the end of the Bible, what does it record? Very surprisingly enough, it records of the end of the history of the earth and the universe and the mankind. In Revelation, the last chapter, it records. I think we need to find it. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Let us read together. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. The Bible, very surprisingly, starts with the beginnings of this universe and then ends with the end of the universe. The one who has started and ended the history of the universe if we were to simply say the one who has a control or is the Lord or owner of the history of mankind and the universe, the amazing creator God has given us this Bible and therefore we are learning the scriptures in this time throughout this week. And therefore in Jeremiah, or sorry, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16, it says, search from the book of the Lord. What does it mean by Lord? It, in other words, is the creator God. God has revealed to Moses the name of his. And because mankind does not know themselves with the knowledge, with the um, experience of their own, they're not able to know. And therefore, uh, God reveals as a revelation and therefore, this book is a book of revelation. Who is God? What kind of work does he do? What is the plan? What is his will? And the book that tells us the plans of God is the Bible itself. But who is this Jehovah or Lord? He is who uh, his name means 
I am who I am. What does that mean? It means that he is the uh, origin of all things. Even if we look at all the things in this universe, there is not one item, there's not one thing that is in existence by itself. Without water, without air, man cannot live. We need to be provided for in order to sustain our life. And also this earth that is massive, it is rotating with this power, the strength, the force of the moon. It cannot be in existence without another's providing. It says, I am who I am. I am who I am. I was here from the beginning. I was not created. I am the creator himself. And even before all these things came to existence, he was here. And before there was time, before there was space, before there was materials, all those things were created by God. And the one who governs all those things is God. And he is the one to end the history as well. The book that he has given us is the Bible. And therefore, we need to really check if this is truly the creator God's uh, words, and if so, we're able to find all the answers to our problems. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The Bible provides us the answers to know what is my value, to know who I am, and to live a life like a life that he has given us. And that is what the Bible is. This book is not given by man, but rather it is given by God. If you just take a moment to think about it, this thick book cannot be here by coincidence. Someone would have made it, whether it's man or God. We, and we be, will be able to easily discern whether it is uh, God or man, and how is by the level of the writing? Is it a book that can be written by man? So from today for a week, we're going to find out and realize that this book cannot be written by man. There is not a man who has ever lived that can record the beginning to the end of history of mankind and cannot write about, there's no man that can write about the eternal destination of heaven and hell. And that is what the Bible is. And therefore, this Bible is an amazing pro proclamation. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And that is why we have designated time to study upon the Bible itself, to really check whether this is the word of God. Is this a written uh, book by man, or is it um, written by God? If there's anything that is false, or is there any fabrication, then uh, we can... Um, set it aside saying that this is not something to be believed, but uh, you will, by studying the scriptures, we will come to realize that it's actually the book of God and why we should believe in it. Why did God have to give us the Bible? Because of our powerlessness. You know, we are, lim we are limited by so many things. We're limited by time. We're limited by space. We cannot go into the past. We cannot even go into the future. And within the space and within the time, we are limited. And therefore, we are also going beyond that. We are uh, limited by our knowledge and also uh, the experience as well. And therefore, we will not be able to understand accurately what is the will of God. And therefore, the invisible God has given us this book to realize that the existence of God is quite clear. And also the plan and the will and the characteristics of God and all the answers to man's problems to resolve all that he has given us the Bible because there's a limit to the power of and ability of mankind. God has given us the Bible to help us in Rome, uh, John chapter one, verse one, there's quite amazing proclamation that the word itself is God. 
because he has spoken these words himself, whenever we are, uh, think, we are uh, experiencing the words, we are experiencing God, and we'll be able to realize the will of God through these scriptures as well. The creator God, the only way he has allowed us to come to know him is the word of God, the Bible. And therefore, we need to have a revering heart in studying the words, whether this is truly the truth or not. And that's the heart that we should have while studying the Bible. In John chapter 4, it states that God is spirit. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is not a being that has a visible flesh like us. And therefore, um, it says in the scriptures that looking at his resurrected body, that um, the spirit does not have bones or skin or flesh, and therefore you cannot be able to see it. The creator God is a spirit, and therefore, he wants to show us as, as though um, it's a perfect picture. And he depicts God through the Bible. In John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is invisible to our eyes, and therefore... He has created a realm that is invisible as well. He has created our hearts and he also sees our hearts as well. And therefore he can tell whether we are uh, sincerely searching for him. And therefore it says that uh, he, he asks of us to worship in spirit and truth. So how was the scriptures recorded? Is it truly the word of God? And so we're going to look at how the, proce the process of how the Bible was recorded and also preserved. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God directly in control according to his will has, has written the scriptures and that is the Bible. The ones who actually wrote it down was man, but the being that was within their spirit and also uh, was in governance of their life and also uh, their experiences was God himself. And therefore, uh, he has led them to write the scriptures that cannot be explained uh, otherwise. Starting from Genesis to Revelation, all the Bible, all the scriptures was written Within the, within the governing of God. And inspiration, if you actually look at the uh, translation, it says that he has inspired or breathed out the scriptures. God has controlled and in his control through the writers, the recorders, he has uh, led them to write the Bible, to record the Bible. And that is uh, the scriptures that we have in our hands today. And so it's written that they were moved by the Holy Spirit. If you see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but men, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This scripture has no thought of man. There was no will of man included. Everything was within the governance of God. Starting from the beginning and to the end, it was written under the control of God. And man was merely the pen that wrote it down. It was God who wrote it, but it was uh, uh, using the tool of a man. In Jeremiah, it records that God calls upon Jeremiah. And he tells Jeremiah what he is going to do in the future. And so Jeremiah heard the words of the Lord and then wrote it down. 
And the people who did so at the time was uh, prophets and they spoke on behalf of God and was a representation of God to the people. So why do we say that it's a word of God? Because God spoke the words and man wrote it. Let me read the words that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Until now, uh, until the end, there is one word we need to take notice of, and it is the Lord. The history of mankind, uh, man actually separates the history from God, and therefore they think to themselves that they are the owners of history or this universe, but that's not the case. Who is the governor? Who is the sovereign? Uh, who is the sovereignty of this man of the history of mankind? Who is the sovereignty of this world, the universe? It is God Himself, and therefore it is His words. And there, in English, it's called history. If we were to divide it, it's His story. It is His story. History is a story of God. He is the one who is in control and he's still in control today. And therefore through the Bible, if we were to set aside the Bible and look at uh, the history of mankind, it seems very chaotic. But if you actually look at it through the uh, eyes of the Bible, you can tell that there is the controlling hand of God. Why do we say that the Bible is the school? the word of God, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel saying, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. God spoke and Jeremiah wrote and the written scriptures that uh, was recorded was delivered to the Israelites. The, the story of God or the words of God uh, was given to Jeremiah and Jeremiah wrote it and therefore it, the book is titled Jeremiah. And because this is the scriptures, uh, because the Bible is the word of the creator God, we say that the Bible is the word of God. And when did the Bible first be recorded? This is only possible because God wrote it. Uh, the first book was written 3,500 years ago, and the first recorder of the Bible was Moses. And in the beginning, it records of the creation of the universe, and that was given to Moses. And therefore, Ge Genesis was recorded, and through Moses, five books were written, and it continued to be recorded until Jesus came. Uh, 39 books were recorded, and these 39 books that were recorded are titled or categorized as the Old Testament, meaning the old promise. The promise that he will give or send the Christ, the Savior. And therefore, in the Bible, it says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. The Bible in entirety shows to us and tells us that Jesus is the Savior. And then after the Old Testament, it is recorded of uh, what Jesus has done, the work that he has done. And the remaining of that, uh, of the Bible, 27 books, is called the New Testament. So at the end of the New Testament, that is the entirety of the Bible. And so 66 books comprise um, is the Bible. And we are living in 2022, but very amazing enough, the Bible was recorded at the beginning 3,500 years ago. And then it was written over 1,600 years. And then 2,000 years ago, the recording of the Bible ended. But what kind of content is included in the Bible? It's the entirety of the history of mankind, the entirety of the history of the universe. The world that is limited within the world in space and also time, everything is written within it. Isn't that amazing? That in itself shows that it is the words of God and not the words of man. And very amazing enough, the history of mankind aligns with what is written in scripture. 
it is a, a clear evidence that it is recorded, the book was recorded by one writer, one author. And so the Bible, uh, the content of it is from the beginning to the end of human history. And not only does it record of the visible world, the visible earth that we live on, but rather it talks about the spiritual realm and also that of the eternity. And it talks about the plan of God in the midst of that. So we're going to start from the beginning this week to really check whether this is the truth. And after we have checked that out, then everyone will be able to very naturally realize and accept the fact that it is truly the word of God. And that is why God in Romans has said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God is quite confident that within the word of God, regardless of who you are, you will have the evidence to have a belief that will not change. There is no other uh, method and there's no other um, thing that we need to focus on. Faith is by the word of God. So how was the word of God recorded? Most of the individuals who received the word of God was Jews. And through Abraham, a nation was born and that nation itself was Israel. And through Israel, God has uh, provided the word of God. And then it has been preserved to this day to be spread to the ends of the earth. Those individuals received the word of God, wrote it down and compiled it together. And because we need to preach it, they have transcribed it to multiple different uh, uh, papers or books. And therefore we have a original copy and also there are copies or transcriptions of those Bibles. And just the number of the copies is over 30,000. But very amazingly, the content of the transcriptions are 100% uh, equal or the same as the Bible that we have today. And you can see how uh, precious the individual thought of this Bible or the word of God and how much effort they have put in to preserve the word. Um, in actuality, the reality was that whenever the name of God appeared in the Bible, Yahweh, the the writers would go take a bath and then come back to write the name. And in order to write this holy name, they, uh, they wanted to prevent any mistake. And therefore, the Bible or the scriptures and the copies of them are all the same. And a representation of those uh, scrolls is the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the reason why these are titled the Dead Sea Scrolls is because they have been found in the cave near the Dead Sea. And to be exact, it was found in the cave of the Qumran cave. And how old does these scrolls date back? It was, uh, they were copies that were wrote, written 2,200 years ago, 2,400 years ago. And very amazingly enough, the copy coincides with the scriptures that we read today. So for 2000 years, not one word has changed and it's been uh, brought down throughout history. The Bible is the truth, they say. In order to be called the truth, it needs to go through many conditions. There needs to be no change that ever happened to it. If there was any change that happened, then it cannot be the truth. It cannot become the truth. The Bible has never changed. After its uh, writing, it has been preserved as is to come to our time today. And these Dead Sea Scrolls, very amazingly enough, um, if put side to side uh, with the scriptures that we read today are the exact same and it is preserved in Israel. I'm oh, sorry, in Britain. 
Let us actually look at this. Judean wilderness, on the edge of the Dead Sea, in a place called Qumran, came some of the most significant artifacts of modern times, the Dead Sea Scrolls. For two millennia, the Dead Sea Scrolls lay hidden in 11 caves throughout the Qumran area. Their discovery marked the biggest archaeological find of the 20th century. To learn more, we hiked up to one of those 11 caves with Stephen Fawn, founder of the University of the Holy Land and an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And why are they so important to us today? The uh, reason why the Dead Sea Scrolls are important is because they confirm the Bible that we have. There's variants, but basically it's, you can hardly tell the difference between the two texts that we have in Qumran and in our own Bibles. The scrolls provide a 2,000 year old link between the scriptures during the time of Jesus and today. Because we can actually hold the same scrolls in our hands that they held in their hands 2,000 years ago. How can we really check that this is truly the words of God and how can we confirm this fact? It's because God has shown uh, us the method of whether to check whether it is the truth, and that is the prophecy and the fulfillment. Because he has written the truth, because he has written the fact, once we confirm this, we will be able to confirm that it is truly the truth. And in 2019, it's recorded that there was 3,384 languages that the Bible was translated to. There are about two, approximately 200 countries out there. But how, uh, and the Bible itself was translated to 3,384 languages. The reason being is so, it's because that this book ought to be read by all individuals, by everyone. Right now it's um, 3,415 uh, languages. And then now 3,400, over 435 uh, languages. And also it's the number one book read in the world. And the reason being is because it is the word of the creator God. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 to 22, it tells us how we can believe that it is truly the word of God. He has written the method here. Verse 21, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? The Lord, the creator God, I am who I am, the almighty God. What, how can we tell that this is the word of God? Whether this is the truth or not, how can we tell? Verse 22, when the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. This, if this is not the truth, if this is not what happened, and if this it's not what will happen in the future that we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to waste our way our lives with it. Of course, we can tell who it is God. Who is God that he's able to proclaim this? If it is a word of God, there will be um, evidence. The fact that he really is in control because he is the omniscient God Um, the representative characteristics of God is that he is omniscient and, um, um, and all-powerful as well. And that is why he is able to write in events the history of mankind. And this is who God is. Who is God? God knows everything. He knows the start and the end of the universe and its history. What this means is that there's nothing more that he needs to know. He knows everything. And that is the God of the Bible. And therefore, within the Bible itself, he has written from beginning to the end the history of humankind. 
And this is the perspective of the Bible. We can look at the whole history from beginning to the end, the history of mankind through the Bible. And this is quite amazing. I, who am living in the year 2022, I'm able to look at the beginning of the history and I'm able to even look at the end of history even. And that is why the Bible is a window to the whole history of mankind. And because it is the history of mankind in year 2022, today, it is recorded in the Bible as well. As also, very amazingly enough, it's also recorded of the things that will happen in the future. In a book that was written 3,500 years ago, it records of the future that has not even happened yet in our time. And so we are able to confirm what will happen in days to come. Why? Because everything is the truth. Because it is the truth, there is the evidence. Because it is the truth, we'll be able to see the fulfillment of it word for word. And so through evidence and also through fulfillment, by confirming this, we'll be able to know exactly that it's the word of God. What does the Bible record of? These are the topics that the Bible records of. Because he is the creator of the uh, universe, he, is, he wrote about the creation of the universe. And because he is the one who governs the history of mankind, the history of the human um, mankind is recorded. About the creation, about the history of humans, and also about the uh, value and also the purpose of life. And also about the spiritual world that is in existence as well. All those things, when we see that all these things are 100% true, if, we're not, if we are able to not doubt in those things, we'll be able to um, receive it as a truth. And if you just take the time to study upon the Bible, we'll realize that, yes, the Bible is true. And in fact, it is the word of God. And in fact, God lives, is living. Is he truly the creator of God? And did this universe really come in existence by creation? We're going to look at that first. And also, when God has created the heavens and the earth, in the universe and the earth and also the, everything that is within there are many secrets that are included in the bible and also in the nature that we live in and so we can prove that the words of god are true through those things the fact that he is really truly the creator god that is the fact that we're going to confirm today and then starting from tomorrow we're going to really check uh, check whether the Bible records of the history or not. And by checking out those things, we'll be able to find out that the fact that God is living and truly the Bible is the word of God. All things. All creation. It proves just with these things that God lives. Is it by coincidence or is it by design? Everything that is in existence today has been designed by the wisdom of God and everything has a power, the Godhead of God within. And therefore, if we just take a moment to look at the nature and the creation of around us, we'll be able to tell that God is really living. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. This is a logic that can be accepted by anyone. Every house is built by someone. A house cannot be in existence without a builder. In order for a house to be in existence, it needs to have someone who has the ability to make or, or build the house. And then they need to have, they have to have the materials as well, the materials. They need to have not only the ability to make it, but also the materials as well. So the wisdom and also the power 
What did I say as well? And materials. Um, I'm sorry, the longer I live in the States, there are, um, I'm forgetting my Korean. How is it that this uh, world came to be without a builder? A person who accepts the fact that a watch can be in existence by coincidence, by chance, without a maker, you know, that'll be observed, right? Without even one gadget, without one item that is included in here, it cannot function. In order to have a functioning watch, you need to have all these parts. How can this house come to be by chance? If you look at the creation, all things around us, things are even much more complex. There is order to it. And there is a great power that is lying within, hidden within. How can you say that these came to be by chance? These are the words of God. If you say that this is by chance, then you are giving an excuse. You are not giving a statement that is according to your conscience. You are not speaking according to your conscience. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. We cannot see those things because it's so great. But through the things that were made by the creation of the world, we're able to see the eternal power and the Godhead, the wisdom of God. That Godhead, the wisdom of God, are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made. Within the space that we can see, within the things that are in existence, within the limited time that we have, the wisdom and the power of God, because all those things are within, anyone who sees these things cannot make the excuse that there is no God. What does it mean that the, to say excuse? Um, to say, oh, he's, he doesn't live. He's, there's no God. There's no God who exists. That is an excuse. If you see here, there is a robot dog. We say that, oh, he, they, the, they made it well. There's no one that says, oh, it's, it's here by chance because the reason being is because that even a robot cannot be made by chance. Can you say that a living dog is here by chance then? It's so cute. God has created it to be cute. And that's why a dog and a man can be friends. How cute are they? You know, a, uh, a teddy bear was made by someone, but what about a real bear? Coincidence or by chance, it's, it's not possible. And therefore, it's the truth that there is a creator. Nowadays, robots are made so well. But when you look at the robots, you clap your hands and applaud saying that's made so well. 인간이 만든 로봇입니다. This is the robot that mankind has made. You know, he did very well, right? How can it move by itself like that? But very amazingly enough, we are not amazed by man. The world championship titles, we still got to do it. That is outrageous. Who, got the Who did it better? Who was better? The man. If you see the human body, you can tell that it was by design. 
there are 206 bones and it stays within its place. And then there are muscles that intricately use, um, move those bones as well. If you just look at your hand, you can see that it is made. If we say, let's gather, the fingers gather like this to hold, grab something. And the fingernail is always located here. Why? So you can grab things very well. And also the nostrils are face down. What happens if it was facing up? Because everything that falls will fall into your nostrils. You know, even if it rains, it's okay. Even if it, if dust come down, it's okay. It doesn't go into your body um, just naturally because these things are by design. You know, you're amazed by the watch that is made by man, but do you know how amazingly this universe is moving right now? The earth revolves around the sun one time in a year. And for 365 days, they are rot it's rotating uh, each day. It's, it's more precise than a watch. And because God has created it, he has created it in a way so that man can inhabit it. This is where earth is. And if you see the distance from the sun, the place where the earth moves is the only place, the only place that water can exist as liquid form. Our body is 70% water. Without water, we cannot live. And very amazing enough, the earth does not go beyond this life zone, does not go past this life zone. Who can say that this is by chance? If, this, if the earth was closer to the sun, then everything will burn up. If it was a little bit further, then everything will freeze. By keeping this distance continuously and keeping the speed, there is not even a second of a chance of change or difference. And that is the place that we live right now. The fact that there is a creator God is an undeniable fact. If you see many things, if you see in the book of Job, it says, even look at the animals. Everything was created by God, but now ask the beast and they will teach you and the birds of the air and they will tell you or speak to the earth and they will teach you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. We are living within the realms that is created by God Therefore, through the creation that is created by God, we'll be able to come to know and believe in God. Do you know the woodpecker? A woodpecker, when it's pecking the wood, is twice the speed of a bullet. It, it pecks 15 times in a second. But there is not a woodpecker that complains of being uh, experiencing concussion. Why? How can it hit the wood or peck the wood 15 times in a second and not experience a concussion. Because within the head of a woodpecker, what is there? There's a sponge. And the sponge can, can um, take away the power uh, of hitting the, at the speed of twice a bullet's spe uh, speed. And also the body, uh, sorry, the tongue is, it, it holds on to the head and therefore the brain does not shake. And therefore, even though it pecks the wood 15 times in a second, they do not experience a concussion. Who can make such things? How can this come by chance? Look at this, a woodpecker, 15 times a second, it, it pecks the wood. A hummingbird, it, wing, it, um, 
it fans its wings 80 times in a second. And that's just nothing compared to a fly. A fly, 250 times a second. And therefore, it's so hard to catch a fly. And that's why you need a fly catcher. In a second, it flops its wings 250 times. And that's why it moves so fast. That's how God has made it. But if you look at the, the anatomy of a fly's wings, it's made so that it can flap 250 times. Man cannot make this. Let's look at a hummingbird. The ruby-throated hummingbird. He's a star of the park and a masterful flyer. With his flexible shoulders, he can move his wings in a figure eight pattern more than 60 times a second. It's not by chance. There's not one thing that is strangely made of its own. Oh, where did that video go? I need to show this to you. Let me show you. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8, it says, Who are those who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roots? The doves, they fly to their roots. And in the end times, it's, it's talking about the Israelites returning to their homeland. But this pigeon or a dove, it says it will come back to its roots. It's a very amazing uh, innate, innate, innate power or uh, ability of these animals. It has the exact precision of finding their own roost. Why is that possible? Because in their brains, they have a compass. And what is that compass? It has the whole map of the earth. And therefore, they're able to have the ability to find their way regardless of where they are in, uh, in the world. And because their brains are acting like a compass, they know exactly where they are on the earth. They have their own map in their minds. And so let me give you an example. Let's say that I'm in here and living in Atlanta and with a dove or pigeon, I take it to Washington and then I let it go and it flies away. And even though it is covered, its eyes are covered, even though they did not see anything in the process, they're able to find their homeland. Exactly. Within the mind or the brain of a bird, who is the being that's able to place the map of the entire earth? Let's find the video here. And looking at this video, I was amazed. It's in English, sorry, although it's simple words. Bridgeport, West Virginia, 320. Bridgeport, West Virginia, 320 kilometers away. In just a few minutes, these pigeons will use another one of their superpowers. They'll find their way home from a place they've never been to before. It's an internal drive scientists call homing. Drop a pigeon almost anywhere, even thousands of miles away, and they'll successfully find their way home. In West Virginia, the race is on.
pigeons who sense magnetic fields. On each side of the pigeon's upper beak are hundreds of magnetic sensing crystals. They create a three-dimensional picture of the Earth's magnetic field to help pinpoint the pigeon's location. In other words, pigeons have a built-in, state-of-the-art GPS system. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. Out of the blue, a bird blocks it onto the landing board. It's number 515. He's home. Do you know why he was able to return the fastest? I just caught the video, but there's a reason why he has returned the fastest. Because he had a partner. Very amazing, isn't it? He was he loved his partner so much. You like your partners, right? So he wanted, he missed his partner so much, and so he flapped faster. And so the pigeon themselves, it seems like they are animals that love their partners. And also, I'll show you another interesting video as well. And it's showing that this uh, universe did not come to be by itself. You know, solar is uh, eclipse. What is solar eclipse? A solar eclipse is um, between the sun and the earth, the moon intervenes. And whenever the solar eclipse happens, the, the, the size of the moon and the sun becomes the same without any um, error, it, the, the, the size is exactly the same and therefore is able to cover the whole sun and that's why the solar eclipse happens. And we thought this was quite interesting. And so if you look at the science of it, mathematically speaking, it has the perfect precision or the size to do so. If you say that the distance between um, the earth and the moon is one, then the sun and the, 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 the earth are 400. And it's the same proportion between the sun and the earth and the moon between the distance between the moon and the earth. And Therefore, also the proportion between the size of the sun and the moon um, is, is that, is such that it precision as well. And therefore, it can do that. Its disk exactly covers the sun. And the chances of that occurring are so literally astronomically small. It's, it's very disturbing. The sun's diameter is 400 times greater than the moon. And coincidentally, the sun also happens to be nearly precisely 400 times further away. This is the reason that the sun and the moon appear the same size in the Earth sky and why we on Earth can experience eclipses of the sun. It's just perfectly in that orbit to eclipse our sun. The odds of the moon being in that orbit accidentally are a zillion to one. So that right there is evidence that our moon is in a perfect orbit around our planet that's not accidental. In order to have a solar eclipse, the moon has to be exactly the size that it is, which is 2,160 miles. Not 2,161, not 2,159, but 2,160 miles at its equator. And there are people out there that actually think that's a coincidence. The fact is, is that that is by design. All things, they have a design. And what that means is that there's a designer. 
And it also shows what kind of power, what kind of wisdom they have looking at those things because it cannot happen by accident. No matter how much a pigeon is trained, they're not able to have that capability. You know, a bee that we know of, when it makes a beehive, it makes it into a hexagon. Do you know the secret of a hexagon? It's the uh, it's a uh, shape that can fit as, as much honey as possible. It's not something that they're trained in, but rather it's something that's innately designed within them. There is nothing that is not made by the hands of God. We're living in a very amazing world. Even if one condition was taken away, mankind cannot live within universe. If you go past the boundary of the earth, the water that, or the, the oxygen that we breathe in and the water that we drink in is not there. We are living in the perfect conditions for man to live so that we are without excuse. The, the existence of a creator God is undeniable and undeniable. It is perfect, it's designed. There is a designer. There is a power behind it, right? It's not by chance. And also, in the Bible, it's recorded a lot about the creation. Is the Bible really the word of God, the creator? And he has written the many mysteries of the creation, something that mankind cannot have understood um, back then. What's inside? You don't know. Why is that so? Because I'm the one who made it. I know what's inside. The God who has created the universe, does he know all the mysteries of the universe? Of course he does. I'm going to tell you what's inside. A, a cat is exercising to become fit. What does that mean? He's saying, I'm going to become a fit cat, right? Then what's inside now? What's inside now? A elderly woman is dancing because she probably made a lot of money. In the Bible, is it true that the mysteries of the universe are written in within? If he is truly the creator of God, he will write in detail, truly, that he, uh, the details of those mysteries. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens, the universe, the earth. If God is truly the creator of all those things, then he knows the mysteries that lie within. And so I'm going to show you a number of evidences, but this is not able to be explained by the experience or the knowledge of man. This is the scripture that was recorded in Job 3,500 years ago. It, it was uh, prior to Prior to Moses, there was the man Job who lived, and he recorded the scriptures 3,500 years ago, and it is written, uh, it, it explains exactly the description of the universe. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord, I am who I am, he has created all these things. And therefore says, all those things belong to God. Heaven and the highest heavens. To the people who look from the earth, there's only one heaven. There is a sky heaven, you know, night heaven. Uh, but we can't say that there are multiple heavens that we can see from the earth, right? But 3,500 years ago, in the time of Job, it says there are multiple heavens or multiple skies. 
heaven and the highest heavens. In Genesis chapter one, it says the heavens and the earth. If you see in Nehemiah, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. It's saying that he is the Lord, and he is explaining the structure of the universe, and it says the heaven and the heaven of heavens. And as science is developed, we have proven this to be a scientific fact. The circle is around the earth, and this is showing the sky that we know of, the sky that we experience, but that's not it. That's not everything. But the earth is just a planet within the solar system, and as the systems, there are multiple systems. Uh, we cannot count all of them, how many, there are 100 to 200 billion systems, like the solar system, and that makes up the galaxy. We cannot count it all. And these galaxies, like our Milky Way, if 100 billion of these galaxies gather together, that makes a galaxy group. And as those uh, galaxy groups are gathered together, it makes the universe that we know of. So heaven and the heaven of heavens, the only one who knows this exactly is God. In other words, because this is the word of God, starting from the beginning, the beginning of the recording, it records that in the universe, there are heavens of heavens. And the one who has written the Bible is God. And let's look at a number of other evidences as well. In Job chapter 38, verse 31, I was shocked because this is not the words of man. Man cannot have written this. There's no way that man can say such things. Chapter 38, verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades? Pleiades, have you heard of it? How is it that this is a famous constellation is because it is the brightest star. But when we say Pleiades, before they said there was seven sister stars, and in China, they said six stars that, brought, that were shined, seven to six stars. But that is the Pleiades that we know of originally in history. No matter how much you look from the earth, um, they, they look like six to seven stars. But as science developed, and now we can even put out the telescopes out into space and they can take it from there. And the mystery or the secrets of Pleiades has been discovered. Do you know what kind of star Pleiades is? Just as we can see from this verse, it's a cluster of stars. 3,500 years ago, can you bind the cluster of the, of the Pleiades? Can you bind the clusters? Can you make the clusters as I have as the Pleiades, that complex, that, that perfect constellation? Can you make it? He's asking Job. He's saying, do not be arrogant as man. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades? Oh, it says is this cluster of Pleiades? And uh, nowadays we can show you um, by science as a group of stars, cluster of stars. It's talking about group of stars. That's what a cluster is. But what is a Pleiades? Pleiades is what? A cluster of stars. And this has been proven in our time. This is not able to be recorded by man. Let me show you. Pleiades, if you see in, in our eyes, it looks like six stars. But in the most recent discoveries, they said it's over 10,000 stars. Each star is a cluster of these stars. It's called star clusters. If you see here, it looks like one, but if you go closer and zoom in, 
there are numerous stars that cannot be measured. Let me show you. It's one, but if you go closer and look in detail, if you zoom in, it's a cluster of stars. That's what a cluster is. It's like a cluster of grapes, just as one cluster of grapes has multiple grapes on it. And just as um, a bouquet of flowers, they, it's like multiple flowers, right? Just as that, God has binded them as a cluster of stars. And 3,500 years ago, God has spoken these words directly. This is the words of God. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades? Can you bind them? God has done it since he's the creator God. It's showing the almightiness of God. It's actually a cluster. This amazing and massive universe, there is truly a creator who created these things, and this is a word of his. This Bible, this book cannot be written by mankind. This is not only the, the only evidence. Um, this is a picture that was taken from NASA, and at that time, there was 3,000 stars at the time. And then the more that we have discovered, the more that we look into it, there are 10, over 10,000 stars um, in the most recent um, reference that we found. Um, Joe chapter 26, it says that he stretches out the north over empty space. And he hangs the earth on nothing. He has hanged the earth on nothing. You know, the people who live on this earth cannot say this because if you've never gone outside the borders of the earth, you cannot say that the earth hangs on nothing. We are living in a place where gravity exists. Everything falls, right? But this massive earth is hanging on nothing. Who can say this? And the fact that there is an empty space out in the north, who can know this? You know, there's no way that man could have seen this or there's no way that man could have gone there 3,500 years ago. But through the, uh, the development of a telescope, they have shown that 1% of the entire universe, the size of that is actually uh, empty space. In 1981, this was an article that was um, published in the New York Times, and you can actually find it today on their website. It was an amazed, a vast hole, a space that um, a galaxy can uh, fit, to, oh, about 2,000 galaxies can fit into it. Long ago, uh, they thought that the Earth was flat, and if you go out too far, then if you go out too far, then you'll fall, right? You're going to die. And there were the ancient Indians who thought that uh, something supported the earth. And what if it was maybe a elephant? They probably thought they thought of it to this level. And they said, oh, how can even stars hang on nothing? And they thought that there were strings that hung on them. This was the... Uh, ideas of the earth or the, uh, the universe 
um, from the ancient civilizations. And what we have discovered in our time is that the earth hangs on nothing, in fact. And even in the Bible, it records of the things that happen underneath the earth's crust. In Job chapter 28, verse 5, it says, As for the earth, from it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. It says that on the earth or on the earth's crust comes bread. There's a lot of crops that come forth, but underneath it, it turns up, like, up as by fire. If you are not the creator of the earth, you're not able to say these things because this is not just based on the imagination of mankind, right? If you actually split the uh, earth, you can see the fire that is underneath and that is turning up. And by science, we have proven this. And there's a lot of time that uh, it took to prove this. And in the 1800s is when this was proven. Sorry, 1900s. And then what is happening? It's not just fire, but it's turning up. This has been proven scientifically as well. And the rain that we see time to time, that also is created by man. He not only saves the people with rain by providing water, but he also gives lightning. And it says that lightning gives us abundance of food. This is a natural phenomenon, and this is a scientific fact that we have been proven in our time. This is lightning. In chapter 36, it says, look, he scatters his light upon it. When there is lightning, in verse 32, for by these he judges the peoples. By the lightning, if you see in the Bible, he has actually judged people with lightning. And also by lightning, he gives food in abundance. If you see in the English translation, it says, gives food in abundance. The fact that lightning and food have a correlation, it's not just the rain, but also the lightning is connected as well, has a correlation as well. And this is not able to be seen to our eyes. We don't see like a lightning and then a lot of fruit, um, fruit uh, is bared. And then if, if there's lightning, there's a lot of rice that grows. That's not what happens. We can see like exactly, like immediately before our eyes. But we have proven by science in our times that when a lightning strikes, the nitrogen that is in the air actually severs the bonds between the nitrogen and then um, it mixes with the water and becomes a natural fertilizer and it goes into the ground to uh, provide nutrition for the crops and for the plants. And when we eat the plants, then naturally we receive the nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most basic form for any protein. And so without uh, nitrogen, man cannot live. I'll show you a video. This is a science TV show. Of the surface of the sun. As it burns through the atmosphere, the electricity breaks apart the molecules of nitrogen contained in the air. A lightning stroke it actually splits the nitrogen into single nitrogen molecules. Nitrogen doesn't like that. It's desperately looking for something to connect back to with, and uh, it often does it with oxygen. When oxygen bonds with nitrogen, it creates a vital nutrient called nitrate. Most people are familiar with nitrates because they're fertilizers. So when it rains in the thunderstorm, in a way you're getting a free fertilizing because the water will have nitrates in it. Nitrate is absorbed through the roots of plants and enters the food chain. When we eat these plants, the nitrates become available to us. 
And so this vital nutrient enters the cells of every living organism on Earth where it is critical for building the structure of plants and helps make proteins and DNA in our bodies as well. It is essential. Isn't that amazing? The fact that the Bible proves to us that lightning or the, the lightning breaks the bonds of the nitrogen to provide us with these nutrition. Starting from now, let's think about what is man? This is a question that we need to ask uh, to God as well. And this question was posed by David many years ago. What is man? What is man? Is the body everything? No. Uh, the Bible actually records that the true essence of man is the spirit within. In Psalm chapter 144, David spoke, Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him? Or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. David realized that God created the universe for man. And for man, he has created the sun, the earth. And for man, he has given us food. What is man? What is man? The, uh, the ultimate receiving uh, being of everything that is in the universe is mankind. Isn't that amazing? Because there is a sun, we live. And therefore, the sun's existence is because for me. And the moon is in existence for me, and the food is in existence because of for me. All those variety of fruits, who eats them? Man eats them. And the amazing uh, nature that we enjoy, who enjoys them? Mankind enjoys them. Why is it that man was the center of the creation of God? What is man? What is man that you take knowledge of him, that you think so preciously of me? How precious are your children? God has given you that mind, the heart that you think preciously of your children. But as soon as you give birth to your child, you may not have had this love before, but from that point on, you have this immense love for your child. Um, recently, I heard an interview from a American person. He says that the direction of his life is, can, was different from uh, the point of my child's birth. When did my life change? As soon as my child was born. He said the priority changed. I was the center of everything, but as soon as my child was born, the center of my life changed, right? Why is it that God uh, thinks so preciously and thinks so more uh, importantly of my life? Why does he think so more uh, importantly of the earth? It's because man lives here. But the mystery, the secret is not found in mankind. It's found in God. This body that we have is just a passing shadow. It's so brief in this world. And time is so quick. Time passes so fast. And we're going to meet our death. What are we? The, the answer is found in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It's recorded here the value of man. He knows the value of a human. How precious is a human is more precious than the world. Why? Because within a body, within a man, there is a spirit. God created man in his own image, the image of God. In his own image, God is spirit, remember? And therefore, within the body, 
this body isn't everything. This body is just merely a house that we live temporarily in. And then within, there's a spirit that we live eternity with. You know, our body feels thirst. Our body feels hunger. It's just a sample. He has created this flesh, so we just have a sample to see. Um, in God, John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Spirit does not die. God does not die, and spirit is, lives for eternity, and therefore we have a spirit that lives for eternity as well. What is man? Man is spirit. And so we're going to look at a number of evidences, the existence of spirit. When God has created all things in this world, uh, he only gave a spirit to mankind. There is no spirit that is given to animals. An animal has a soul and a body, but there is no image of God. And therefore, there is a big difference, a very clear difference between uh, animal and man, and that is the existence of a spirit. Yes, we may look similar to an animal, but it's not the same. You know, what is what animal is there that desires for beauty and desires for the things that I'm going to explain to you? The first difference is a sense of religion. Uh, because we have a spirit, we have the nature to seek for God. Just as a child seeks for their parents or for their mother, likewise, uh, we have a spirit that naturally seeks after God. And so everyone has a sense of religion. Whenever they are met with hardship, they immediately pray and they seek something to rely on, right? It's a sense of religion. No matter how much you teach to an animal, it cannot pray. But man, they say, let's pray to God and they uh, pray, right? Even when I was younger, I, uh, I followed my mother and then I lost her. I lost my way. And it was so vivid to this day. What did I do? I prayed, God, if you're, live, if you're alive, please help me to find mom. I was seeking for a deity. I was seeking for a God. And the second is that uh, because we have the image of God, we have a conscience we have a spirit within me, and therefore a characteristic of a spirit is a conscience. And because we have this conscience within as mankind, what, uh, how far does it continue in our lives until the time we have judgment, until judgment is going to be with us? Um, an animal is not guilty or feel guilt for killing another animal. But well, what happens if uh, mankind kills another person? They know that they have the sense that this was a sin. They have uh, guilt within their conscience. And then there is a sense of eternity. In Ecclesiastes, it records that when does man feel the most uh, happy and when they have a sense of satisfaction is because when they have uh, achieved eternity, because the spirit does not die. And therefore in the Bible, it says that the, uh, the make of a man is so. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man has a spirit, soul and body. And so a man, if you look at the uh, they have a sense to uh, receive the outside uh, world, and that is your body. And then within your soul, you have the emotions, intellect, and also the will. And then within the spirit, they have uh, the image of God, the true self, myself, uh, that is within all those things. And so within the spirit, we have a conscience and also uh, intuition to seek after God and a uh, sense of seeking after, a desire to seek after eternity. And therefore man has a body, soul, and spirit. That's the makeup of man. 
And so we have a spirit that is for eternity that is within. And so only man has the uh, sense of religion, seeking out a religion. And then we have a conscience and also a yearning of eternity. This is not able to be found in, anim in animals. It cannot be trained because we have something different within us. We have a spirit within us. And therefore, on the day that a man dies, it's recorded in the Bible as well. The day that we die, our spirit will go outside of our bodies to go meet God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says, then the dust is talking about the body, return to the earth as it was. Our body was eat, uh, lived by eating the things that came from the dust and therefore our makeup is like the dust. Uh, because our makeup is like the dust in terms of our flesh, it will return to the earth. Um, and then the spirit will return to God who gave it. And therefore it says, remember your creator in your youth. Our spirit does not die. It goes for eternity. The spirit does not die. And therefore on the day that the flesh dies, uh, we will go see God. And so in Hebrews, it says, death is appointed to all men. And after that, the judgment. There is a judgment regarding sin. That is what's waiting for you on the other side of death. And the spirit will go outside of your body to go meet God. And people who actually experience death say it's the same thing. Uh, they experience um, going outside of their body. Me experiencing going outside the body, everyone experiences that when they are, have experienced death. And I... I'm still here, but I've been separated from my body. That is being uh, experiencing outside of the body. And those who have these near death experiences, they say that they have experienced the same characteristic as this. This uh, phenomenon was researched and there are people who wrote about it, made a book. Raymond Moody, this uh, doctor, he's a doctor, he is a cardiologist. And he studied, researched 150 experiences of those who had near-death experience. He himself was um, able to write about this and he wrote the book, Life After Life. You know, what kind of experience did you have? I, I went outside my body and I saw myself and this was my emotion. And he wrote all that down and 150 accounts were all the same. And I also met two people who experienced death and came back to life. And there was one who, uh, who had a fall from, uh, who had, uh, has, had a steel fall down on their head and then someone else who had experienced death in another way. And they all said that they have experienced going outside the body, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their background, regardless of um, their environmental changes or like the, the, cha the difference of their environment, they all experience the same thing. They, uh, they automatically experience this and I'm going to show you a video. And I'll also show you this as well. Uh, this book is titled Evidence of the Afterlife, and this book is even has greater impact because the writer of this book is Dr. Jeffrey Long, and he himself, how many people did he meet? 1,300 people, 1,300 people. He met 1,300 people, and based on their accounts, they're all the same. And he had written down and organized the testimonies of 1,300 people. And something that is clear is this. First is that they have a realistic outside of body experience. They actually go out of the body, they see their body and they also see their surroundings and they, they see the real reality of things that are happening around them. Let's see a video. It's in English, but I'm gonna show you. To life after death, or is it a trick of the mind? Well, with us now is Anne Walsh, who has a remarkable story to tell. When I died, I floated up the ceiling, and then I went through this tunnel. You remember absolutely everything. You feel instantly all the 
effects that any action I had on another person. You, you've, you just literally felt everything. And then came the realization of, I'm not going back. And everything halted and it was, I said, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't stay. I was having a myelogram, which is injecting iodine dye into the base of my neck. The dye accidentally went into her brain, she says, and within moments, consciousness was gone and she was flatlining. I literally went from inside my body when I shut my eyes. I was then just the next second I was up on the ceiling looking down at the entire room. I literally looked down and said, huh, if I'm up here and my body's down there, then I think I must have just died. I was just watching everything happening below me. My spirit came up out of my body in a very tremendous speed. And I could look down and see my body laying on the bed. Then I knew that I had died. And I thought, oh my God, I'm dead. Uh, four times. Uh, once I didn't breathe and I had no vitals for five minutes. Wow. And that was the time that I had the near death experience. It was um, when I had the out of body experience and could see the people working around me. I tried desperately to move an eyelid, a finger, something to let them know that I could hear them saying, well, I think we've lost her. I was saying to myself, no, you haven't. I'm here. But I was like, out. Vicki Noritug lives in Tacoma, Washington, and has been blind since birth. She claims that the only time she's ever seen herself was when she was dead. I was in a very terrible car accident, and I had a skull fracture and a concussion, neck injury, back injury, and leg injury, and I was dead for four minutes. As the medical team in the emergency room tried to revive Vicki, she was watching and listening to everything they said. I was up on the ceiling looking down at everything that was happening. I have had no idea what it was like to see and at first it was foreign and weird and pretty scary. Doctor. This is the words of Jesus. What is the value of a spirit? How precious is man? In Matthew chapter 16, it states, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, meaning his spirit? If you have lost your spirit, then what can it profit him to gain the whole world? What can you exchange for your soul, for your spirit? The value of your spirit is even more valuable than the whole world. If you gain the whole world, but if your spirit were to go to hell, then what profit is that to you? What is more important than the universe is your spirit. It's saying that it's more uh, weightier than the whole world. The spirit does not die. Why does man live? Why did they come into this world? Why did we come into this world? What is the purpose? What, what are we trying to obtain? Because we are trying to live for eternity uh, in heaven, this is the purpose, to gain eternal life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. There is a start and end to all things. In the Bible, it says that there is the beginning of the world and there is the end of the world. It has the destiny of this world. It has the destiny of ourselves in these scriptures. We have met an amazing book. And if you look into the history, if we were to, uh, we have, we have uh, come to the opportunity to obtain this eternal life. There is a purpose under heaven, a time for every purpose under heaven. And this is what purpose are we trying to achieve here? To go to heaven, to have eternal life, 
to have eternal satisfaction. That is the reason why man has been created and is living on this earth. There is a plant, there's animals, there's humans. Why is humans living on this earth? Why did God create humankind? The Bible says that the only uh, thing that was created in the image of God was a human. Why is that he made male and female? No, it says that Adam is the, his, uh, the image of God. Man was created as a partner of love. Man is, is, is very uh, special. Humans are very special. Why did the Bible, why was the Bible given to mankind? So that we come to realization of the love that he has for us so that we can also obtain the eternity to go into heaven. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11, it says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. He has put the desire for eternity in the hearts of man. No matter how much you pour into the heart of mankind, it's like a bottomless uh, pot, a bottomless vessel. Money, pleasure, honor. It cannot um, satisfy your spirit. Why? Because those things you will let go when you meet your death. When you meet the Almighty God, when you have received His love, is when you will be satisfied. God is love. Man is happiest when they receive love, when they're loved, right? When is mankind really happy? When they have realized and received the love of their Creator, that is when you are truly happy. And mankind, they're only happy and only satisfied when they have etern uh, obtained eternal life. Even if you gain this whole world, when you die, you're going to let go of all those things. You can't take those things with you. The reason why we are in this world is to have the purpose of obtaining this eternal life. And that's why he's given us the desire, the yearning for eternity. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one to go to the Father except through me. The reason why he has come into this world is to give us eternity because man cannot achieve it on their own accord. Why are we studying the words in this week? You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. This is the book that is given by the Almighty God, the Creator God. Our destiny is written here. The destiny of the world is written in this book. And the answer is all written in this book, and that is what we're going to be studying upon uh, throughout this week. Tomorrow, we're going to study upon uh, what has happened in history and what's going to be happening in history. It's time from beginning to end. So please come tomorrow, attend tomorrow, and to uh, confirm those things so that you can resolve the problems and issues of life. Let us end with prayer. Dear Father who is living, we thank you for allowing us this time, this opportunity to study upon your word. You know, as those who are uh, desiring to learn more of your words, yearning for your words, we pray that you will bring everything to understanding so that we can come to realize uh, your true lessons and the true secrets of life. And we pray that you will guide us to come tomorrow as well and pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Did everyone enjoy their time?